Well, we are again uh, privileged to have um, Brother Chris uh, Hustler to uh, to preach for us. Uh, last night he preached about the uh, the source in uh, 2 Timothy chapter three, verse sixteen. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Okay, the source and then the service. And so um, tonight uh, he's going to uh, build on that uh, foundation that uh, we had uh, last night. And so um, I ask uh, Brother Chris to, um, to preach for us tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pastor Aralano, and good evening again to everybody. And thank you for uh, your prayers for us in preparation for our time together around the word. And I trust last night was a blessing to you. And we're praying that uh, uh, today and the services on Sunday will also glorify the Lord and edify and encourage his children. Uh, we are thankful that we've had a good report again from Brother Kaufman uh, now at the Mission House in Lusaka and resting. And uh, we're very thankful for answered prayer. We've also been praying for our missionary friend, Brother John LaBelle, uh, whose uh, oxygen supply is now been, uh, the artificial oxygen has been cut down to his lowest level in the last seven weeks. Uh, he's still needing dialysis uh, four days a week for his kidneys. Uh, he still has a lot of infection in his lungs from the COVID. And he's uh, currently in hospital in Johnson City in Tennessee. So if you remember the LaBelle family and the Kaufmans, uh, I know that they would be greatly encouraged to know that uh, people are praying for them. I'm going to take our Bible this evening. And again, we're uh, here in the book of 2 Timothy. In 2 Timothy and in uh, chapter uh, 3. And uh, last night we began by looking at uh, the source. And the simplicity of this is that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And so we looked at the, the fact that God has given us his word. It is God breathed. Uh, someone didn't just sit down one day and say, well, you know, I think I feel like writing something about God. And uh, then years later, someone else said, well, yeah, that was really good. I think I'll build on that. But, but yeah, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. The Holy Spirit is the one who carries along, bears along. If you could picture a, a vessel being carried across the lake with the wind and the sails, the Spirit of God uh, literally carries along the person that is being used as a vessel uh, to record that which God wants to say to mankind and we have the complete canon of scripture there in the word of God and so we don't have to fret and worry uh, we know because it is as we said last night it is without error and the issue of inspiration and inerrancy is very very important uh, we see we, so many books today are very badly flawed in fact just recently um, uh, I was talking with somebody uh, there was a time when you if you uh, back in the days when all the newspapers came out uh, in in paper and print, uh, one of the one of the hardest jobs in the news office was for those for the proofreaders, and uh, I know how difficult that could be for a newspaper uh, article that somebody has to actually sit down and make sure that the the words are spelled correctly, that the grammar is correct, that everything joins together literally. Uh, illiteracy wise properly uh, I don't know if you ever noticed this but a lot of times in these days of cut and paste and print uh, on the internet most news pages uh, you know are just full of errors uh, words are misspelled the grammar is incorrect and so they're definitely not inerrant but the word of God is without error so it is it is proven and it's by its prophecy by its testimony uh, by its witness through mankind. I mean, we have these 40 plus authors over 1500 years and total unity of thought and 100% uh, accuracy in all of its uh, prophecies and its forecasts. And that's what we would expect from an infallible God. 
that's what we would expect from a God who is perfect. But when we go to some of the religious writings of, of uh, various groups today, uh, we find some of these people, I don't know if any of you have ever been to Mauritius, uh, Mauritius is probably one of the most uh, spiritually decadent places you could ever go to. Uh, so steeped in, in hardline Hinduism and Buddhism, and they've got their temples with all of these evil spirits and that. And I mean, the Hindus have 300 million gods. And when you read some of the testimonies and the writings of these various wise men and the words of these gods, I mean, to put it bluntly, they all hate each other. They're always after each other. They're always, they're always fighting and there's a, on, this ongoing fracas because you, you seek to please one God and in the process you've, you've hindered the other 299 million plus. And so you know, th there's no way that you can ever be right with these pagan deities. And uh, you know, it, so it's a real mess. But here we have the God of the Bible who is righteous and holy and true, and he is indeed a God of peace, and he wants to make peace with man, and he has done so through the atonement of his own son, Jesus Christ. And he is a God who is self-revealing. He has revealed himself in two ways, we can say, through his world and through his word. And, and, and the two are in absolute harmony. We don't find anything in science and nature that is contrary or contradictory to the truth of God's word. In fact, we find scientific truths in the word of God that uh, were not discovered until, you know, the 16, 17, 1800s. And yet the book of Isaiah and the book of Job talks about uh, air pressure. Uh, Job refers to uh, the God, a God who does uh, wonders without number and then immediately begins to talk about what we refer to as the hydrological cycle, the cycle of evaporation of water to cloud to rain. I mean, when you think about it, just the rain cycle scientifically is a miracle. We witness this uh, so often in our lifetimes without ever thinking, how is that even possible? And you ask any, any scientist, go, those young people at school, go ask your science teacher, you know, if I've got a cloud up in the sky that's carrying, you know, 100,000 cubic uh, litres of water, kilolitres of water, I mean, you imagine you pick up the average plastic bucket of water, when you pick it up when it's got 10 litres of water in it, weighs well over 10 10, kilo, 10 kilograms. It's heavy. And there's a dark, great dark cloud up in the sky that's carrying enough water to fill Sydney Harbour. And yet it's suspended up there in the atmosphere, passing over the land, because some farmer somewhere out the other side of, of Burke is praying for rain. Now, he might need 50,000 kilolitres of, of rain but he doesn't need it all in one second. He needs that abundance of rain to be scattered over a larger distance and over a longer period of time to give the rain time to seep down into the earth and to nourish the ground and replenish his, uh, his crops and his plantation. So rain in itself is a miracle. And these are all things that we get from the word of God. So last night we, we talked here and looked at this matter of uh, inspiration and the source of God. We touched on also this matter of the service uh, of the word of God and what the word of God does for us. In verse 15, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise under salvation, which is uh, through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. The word of God reveals the sinfulness of man, not to ridicule him, to rebuke him, yes, not to expose it so that he feels, oh, you know, I'm, you know, I'm a dirty, rotten lass. No, but rather to bring that person, that man, through the conviction of the Spirit of God concerning his sin, to bring that person to repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. This is what Paul bears witness had taken place with young Timothy. This is what takes place in every single person who ever comes to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
The Lord Jesus told us that one of the ministries of the Holy Spirit, that when he has come, he will convict the world of sin, of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they believe not on me. Let me ask you, what's the greatest sin in the world today? Is, is it murder? Is it kidnapping? Is it some form of perversion? Uh, is, is it drug trafficking? Is it, is it child trafficking, sex trafficking? Uh, is it rape? Is it thievery? Is it, no, the, the greatest sin in the world today is the, is the sin of unbelief that God has revealed himself to mankind. And Romans chapter 1 tells us without a shadow of doubt that God has revealed himself and the things that are seen are understood by the things that are made so that they are without excuse. Now, the service of the word of God is revealing our sin and revealing our saviour. And many times in, in our pursuit of the knowledge of God and our knowledge of the word of God, we sometimes forget the simplicity of God's provision and plan of salvation. When, when the Philippian jailer sprang in, called for light and sprang into the prison cell, when Paul had said, do thyself no harm, his simple question was, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And Paul said, we know well, you need to come with us and you need to come to church at least a dozen times and you need to learn uh, all these verses of the Bible. Uh, I'm going to give you these uh, the verses of the Romans road and the Hebrews road and the Isaiah road and the Revelation road. And they nearly rode this poor guy into the ground, but that's not what they did. They didn't tell him he had to turn over a new leaf or that he had to go out and start, you know, knocking doors and, and selling Bibles. No, they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thine house. The simplicity of God's salvation. To me, the simplicity in itself, in its service to mankind, speaks of God's great compassion for lost sinful man. But, you know, but we made it so complicated. We make it so difficult. But God, who is merciful, God, who is, who is rich in mercy for his great love, will with you have loved us, the scripture tells us. He's provided this way of salvation. And we went over these things concerning the doctrine, the fact that we need to be taught for doctrine, for reproof. We need to be told what is wrong. Many of us have grown up with a tremendous imbalance we think that there are certain things in our life that are okay. Well, they don't really bother anybody else. Uh, you know, my body is my body, and what I do with my body is my business. And yet we come into the Word of God, and we learn that we are bought with a price, and we're to glorify God with our body and our spirit because they don't belong to us anymore. We're bought with a price. This body belongs to the Lord. You know, for some people, they think that Jesus simply died and purchased, you know, the penalty of my sin, and that's the end of it. No, it's not. He purchased me as a person. He died for me as a person. The Apostle Paul boasts of this in Galatians 2.20 when he speaks of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Hey, we've got a lot of learning to do. As I said last night, the older we are when we come to Christ, the more unlearning we've got to do. And there is always this conflict uh, between us and God and us and the Spirit of God, us and the Word of God, as we are learning things all the time and we are confronted with the reality of how far we have fallen. Sin has done terrible, terrible things to us. Sin has done tremendous damage to us. Thankfully, it is not irreparable other than dying in your sin, and then it is irreparable. But as long as we're in this life as a child of God, the Spirit of God and the Word of God in unison are working to bring about Christ-likeness and change. So he said for doctrine, for reproof, uh, for, uh, sorry, I lost it, for, for correction. So we're told what's wrong and now we're told what's right. And then for instruction in righteousness, he's going to tell us how to walk with him. Paul says to the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 4, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. 
having their understanding dark and being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with all greediness. And Ephesians 4.20 then says, but ye have not so learned Christ. The word of God and the spirit of God are continually teaching me and leading me to be Christ-like in every area of my life. I see the change. I know in my own heart and in my own mind, when I trusted Christ my Savior, I'm not the same anymore. I've been born again. And this great work begins. And this is what I want us to, to look at tonight, because we go from the source and the service to the sufficiency, to the sufficiency of the word of God. There in verse 7, it says that the man of God may be perfect. Now, there are times when the, the phrase man of God is used in reference of, of Paul to a fellow soldier, to another preacher of the gospel. But we can actually apply this term to all of God's children because God is in pursuit of perfection, of the perfection of Christ-likeness, of Christ-like maturity in all of his children, in all of us. Male, female, young and old, rich and poor. It's not a matter of, you know, well, you know, well I didn't go, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a high school dropout or I've got more degrees than the thermometer or, you know, I'm an old worldly wise man or, you know, I'm the local gospel. No, it doesn't matter where you come from. This is not about your intelligence. This is a spiritual realm. This is the realm of the workings of the Spirit of God and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. I want to illustrate this sufficiency for you tonight by looking at a couple of passages of Scripture. If you take your Bible and open to the book of Acts and chapter 17. Acts and chapter 17. We remind ourselves that Paul and Silas have had a wonderful ministry in Philippi. What started out small ended up big trouble. Uh, they were taken. They were humiliated. They were stripped naked in the town square, and they are flogged with rods. Uh, in some parts of Asia and the Orient today, these same rods are still used by way of corporal punishment. In places such as Turkey and Saudi Arabia, uh, other of the Arab, uh, Arabian Emirates and in Northern Africa, they use a rod that would be referred to as a rotan. A rotan is a bamboo cane around about five or six feet long, and at the narrowest end it is split on one side. And what would happen is this, uh, th this execution of this tormentor the punisher, when he administers this rod to the bare back and buttocks and the back of the legs of the man or the woman, as he smacks down with this bamboo, this bamboo where it splits, snaps, shuts and tears out a long slither of flesh out of the victim. Paul makes reference to this in 2 Corinthians and chapter 11 when he says of the number of times he had been uh, beaten 40 uh, with the 40 stripes, save one. Five times, he said, I got these 40 stripes. So 195 times he was beaten with a rod. When Paul says, I bear in my body the marks of our Lord Jesus Christ, he wasn't boasting that he had a tattoo of the cross on his arm. He was telling us he literally had a body that was scarred from the sufferings and the persecution for serving Christ. Now they leave Philippi and we're told here in chapter 17 of Acts in verse 1, now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica where was a synagogue of the Jews. Now Paul and Silas leave peaceably. When they find out that this man is a Roman and that they have beaten him unjustly, they are terrible. They, they are terrified. I mean, seriously, th this is going to spell big trouble for them. Philippi, as we will find out here also with this, Philippi is a free city. 
as a free city, it, it enjoys a certain status under the rule of the Roman Empire. They're allowed to have their own, uh, their own currency. They have their own civil laws and their own civil justice. They, they don't have to keep on running off and getting permission from the emperor to be able to do things within the, within the province of Philippi. They, they have uh, a lot of freedom. Thessalonica is a free city also. And this is an interesting point that we'll come to later on. But we're talking about a distance of around 150 kilometers that these two wounded men are going to walk. 150 kilometers. Now, it might take them more than a week to walk that distance. A brisk walk might see you working, walking at, say, five to seven kilometers an hour. But I dare say Paul, he's no spring chicken, and maybe, he, maybe the rod being applied to the back of the legs made things a little bit stiff in movement, and so he's not getting around as quickly as he used to. But we're told that after some days they come, and Paul's habit was always to the Jew first. And we find here in this city of Thessalonica, there is a synagogue. And we're told here that Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures. So Paul took the Old Testament scriptures, he would take the Torah, he would take the law of the Lord and he goes into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and on three Sabbath days he stands up and he opens up the scripture and he teaches them and tells us in verse 3 here, the Spirit of God tells us, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. I mean, you've got people here. This is a predominantly Gentile city with a Jewish flavor. They have a larger Jewish population, and they have built a synagogue. The synagogue is not a tabernacle. It's not a temple. It's not a place of worship. It's a place of learning. These people go there. Gentiles go there to become Jewish believers, to become followers of the God of Israel. So you can imagine them being instructed in the law of the Lord and the Jewish believers requiring circumcision from them, requiring adherence to the laws of Moses all 613 statutes, judgments, ordinance, records, testimonies, come out, all of those. And most of them are still trying to figure out to this day what is osophrage, because the Bible says in the law you're not allowed to eat osophrage and nobody knows what it was. What a terrible thought for a Jewish person to find out that osophrage was chicken. What a terrifying thought. Same thing for some uh, people to find out that pork tastes good when they're not allowed to eat it. Anyway, so Paul, we're told, and, and it uses here, remember Luke is the writer of the book of Acts, is a very clever man. He, he's not a dum-dum. And he uses this legal treatise language of one presenting a court case to prove his case. And he goes through opening and alleging, showing from the Old Testament, he is Christ. Not only is Christ come, but Christ has come, Christ has lived, Christ has suffered, Christ has bled, Christ has died, Christ is risen from the dead. And this is not a shock or a surprise. This is there in the scripture. Can you imagine Paul opening the Psalms? Can you imagine Paul opening Psalm 22 and saying, who does this speak of? And Paul opening to the book of Isaiah, the prophet, and saying, hey, look in Isaiah 53, who is this? Who is this as a sheep before the shearers is dumb? Who is this but the arm of the Lord? Who is this that makes intercession for the transgressors? And, and the spirit of God is taking the word of God and challenging and convicting and convincing the hearts of people under the preaching. Now, this takes place over three Sabbath days, folks. Three Saturdays. Let me move on. And some of them, verse 4 says, believed and consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks, a great multitude. Let me tell you, the phrase great multitude that Luke uses here is the same phrase, the same word that he uses in the Gospel of Luke for the feeding of the 5,000. 
Now, we know historically that the city of Thessalonica is a city of around 200,000 people. It is a huge Roman outpost. It's there uh, uh, on the peninsula, and uh, it, it provides a great route of access throughout the Roman Empire for their eastern troops. It has become a free city because when Mark Antony was pursuing the assassins of Julius Caesar, a number of battles, the Battle of Philippi, took place out on the plains and the city of Thessalonica and the city of Philippi refused to give aid to the assassins, to Brutus and Cassius and their armies. They wouldn't render them any aid at all. They withstood them. As a result of their loyalty, Mark Anthony, uh, now as one of the rulers of the Roman Empire, accorded them a free status. This was a great, this is a great honour. This is probably one of the things that attracted so many Jews to the city. A free city, you got your own currency and you don't pay tax. Now I can tell you something. I don't know about anyone else listening in. Life. I would love to be living in a country where I didn't have to pay tax. Not one penny. Every penny you earn went in your pocket. Not into Caesar's pocket. Not into the tax man's pocket. You kept it all. And so for these people, this is very, very important. But we're told here, that, and, and the chief women, not a few, but the Jews, which believe not, moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort and gathered a company and set all the city in uproar, and they assaulted the house of Jason, and they wanted, they wanted Paul and Silas, they, they wanted blood. It says here, and this is a, a well-loved a well passage of Scripture, when it says, these that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. What a wonderful testimony that these men have turned the world upside down. But look here for a moment at the accusation they made. In verse 6, it says, when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain of the brethren under the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also, whom Jason hath received, and these do all contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king. This is a political accusation. This is not spiritual. They, they, they're, not accusing, they're, they're not accusing anything about his false teaching from the word of God. They made this a political accusation because if Rome hears we've got another king in this city, no more free city. We lose our status. The, army, the, the arm of Rome will come down. The fist of Rome will smite us good and proper and we'll be treated just like everybody else. No, thank you. And so this, this was the whole plot and plan here. And eventually taking security of Jason, uh, Paul and Silas are, are carried away and, and are released to, uh, to go on their way and they make their way to Berea. Now I want you to come with me over here to um, 1 Thessalonians and chapter 1. And beginning at verse 5. Paul says, for our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost, so that you are examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Archaea. So we're not just talking about a city any longer. We're talking about what we would think of as a shire or a county, what we would think of as a province, as a whole region. But here he actually says Macedonia, which are literally countries. Not large countries, but nations. And he says, in Macedonia and Achaia, for from you the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place your faith to God would is spread abroad so that we need not to speak anything. Wow. 
listen, folks, Paul here, the Spirit of God from the pen of Paul is saying, as we are traveling, as we are seeking to serve the Lord and preach the gospel, we're running into people miles from you. One, 200, 300 kilometers away from Thessalonica, we're bumping into people who are saying, oh, hang on. Is this, is, this, is this the message that they're talking about in Thessalonica? Oh, this is what happened in Thessalonica. Oh, we've heard about how you turned to God from idols. Paul says your faith to God would is spread abroad so that we not, need not to speak anything. For they themselves show what manner of entering in we had. How you turned to God from idols to serve the living and the true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Wow. Let me take you back there to Acts 17. How long was Paul in Thessalonica? Three Sabbath days at least. Now, I'm a school dropout, so I have to work pretty hard to get this, but let's say Paul gets there on a Monday. So we've got Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. There's six days, okay? Sabbath number one. Seven more days gives us Sabbath number two. Um, seven and six is 13. Sabbath number three is seven more days. 13 and seven gives us 20. Let's say he got there a week earlier. And it's a big city and he's got to kind of like find his way around. And he doesn't go to the Sabbath, to the, the synagogue to preach the first time. Maybe he just visits there as an observer, maybe. I mean, he is a Pharisee, a converted Pharisee, but a very learned man. You know, when I sit down and think of the time of arrival to the time of departure, when the trouble starts brewing, you know, the longest time I can give Paul here is probably 35 days, five weeks. Now, in chapter two of Thessalonians, we find that Paul actually bears witness that they were laboring night and day. They were, they were ministering. In verse 9 of chapter 2 of, of First Thessalonians, For you remember, brethren, our labor and travail, for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable to any of you, we preached unto you the gospel of God. So around the clock, as Paul has opportunity, people are coming to him with questions. Paul is meeting them and giving answers. People are hearing the gospel and the word of God preached and taught. But let's remember, five out of eight people in the Roman Empire are slaves and are illiterate. Anything they will ever learn is what they will hear in the ear. They're not going to read it for themselves. You remember the testimony of a certain scribe who stood up and tempted the Lord Jesus saying, you know, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And the Lord Jesus threw it back at him and said, what is written in the law? How readest thou? The level of literacy in the time of Christ and even now in the time of Paul is very, very low. If Jesus had thrown that question out, to, to the general populace there in the synagogue, most of the people would have put their head down and shrugged their shoulders and simply said, well, I don't know, I can't read. And yet he could say to this lawyer, this scribe, what is written, how readest thou? And he, he just rattled it off. And he got it right. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might, with all thy strength, and thy neighbor as thyself. Blah, 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 blah. Thank you. Because he can read. Many of these people, perhaps after hours, they're getting away from their labors to sit at the feet of Paul for an hour or two in the evening. Perhaps some are coming in the wee small hours. But when the apostle Paul is on the clock for God, he's on the clock. And so around the clock, these men are preaching and teaching the word of God. But let me tell you something, folks. Three Sabbath days at the synagogue is not a lot of preaching. 
So how is it possible? How is it possible to have such a, such a radiant testimony as the Spirit of God records of these people? Remember, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. The Spirit of God, the God that cannot lie, said here, for from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God would be spread abroad so that we need not to speak anything. What a testimony. What a witness. That's a Christian life worth having, isn't it? That's a Christian testimony worth really laying hold on. You talk about window shopping in the Bible and you see somebody who's got this kind of testimony and you say, I want that. What have I got to do to get a testimony like that? They had it. How did they get that? How do you get that from three Sabbath days? I got saved February 18th, 1979. That's 42 and a half years ago. I don't think I've got a testimony like that. Let me ask you. Don't raise your hand or nod your head. How long have you been saved? Do you know Christ as your Savior? Have you trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, believing from the very heart that he died for your sin and that he was buried and he rose again? As the scripture said, delivered for our offenses, raised again for our justification, that Christ died for us. And we can take it away from the universal to the very specific and say, Christ died for me the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So out of this great multitude of people, of these devout Greeks and these chief women, we have some six to 10 months later, the letter to the Thessalonians and the spirit of God tells us of this testimony. How is this possible? Well, again, it brings us to this matter of the sufficiency of the word of God. Look with me in chapter two of first Thessalonians and in verse 13. Excuse me. For this cause also, thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Now here there are a couple of words we need to pick up on. One of those words is effectually. A great debate in Australia and around the world at the moment has to do with how effectual are these vaccines? What good is a vaccine if it doesn't work? Does it work? Well, some are saying you get vaccinated, you'll still get sick, but you probably won't die considering the fact that I'm aware of friends overseas who are dying or have died, that makes a very strong argument for those that are not vaccinated. But then again, when they tell you, you're going to have to have a second, and then they tell me, well, you know, it's just like when you got measles and mumps and blah, blah, blah. Well, I only ever got vaccinated for measles and mumps once. I only got vaccinated for TB once. I only got vaccinated. I mean. So there's debate about how effectual, how effective, how well this works. But let's forget about vaccines and jabs and things and tell you and look here when he says to the Apostle Paul says, the word of God which effectually worketh in you. You see, the Spirit of God 
which seals and indwells the child of God, takes the word of God and works it out through our lives. In 1 John and chapter 2, when, Paul, when, when, when John writes concerning the Antichrist and saying that they went out from us for they were not of us, for if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But he says, but ye have an unction with the Father. That unction is the ministry of the Holy Spirit that makes the heart, the, 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 the heart of the saved man tender to the things of God. That's why hardness of heart never belongs in the life of a child of God. Hardness of heart is a pharisaical condition. Hardness of heart is a condition that belongs to the lost sinner. That's why Paul says to the Ephesians that you no longer go on in the darkness, having your foolish heart darkened by the hardness of your heart. We know Christ as Savior. We've now been given a living heart, Christ in you, the hope of glory. You see, the, the thing, the key here is receiving as it is in truth. You see, we live in a day-to-day -day of what I call smorgasbord Christianity. Most of you, they used to use the word smorgasbord. Nowadays, they use a buffet. And you go to a buffet. Now, I like seafood. I hope you'll remember that when I come to visit you again. I don't know, I don't know. Seafood. Um, yeah, I go to a seafood buffet, and they just have an array of different foods to choose from. I mean, there's mud crab and sand crab and snow crab, and, and there's king prawns and coral prawns, the big ones, the little ones, leader prawns. They're these they're tiger prawns that are almost the size of your arm. I mean, you know, you, you, you sit down and chow down there. And, you know, we've, we've got clams and oysters and mussels and, and beautiful baked coral trout and grilled mackerel and snapper. And we've got all this food. And you just go down the line and you choose what you want. But that's not the way the Spirit of God and the Word of God will ever work in your life. Biblical Christianity is not like you choosing options on your new car or walking down the table of a buffet. Say, oh, I don't like that. Oh, holiness, oh, that's, no, no, that's not for me. You see, when we come to know Christ as our saviour, we need to understand that our whole philosophy of life changes under the authority of the word of God and under the guidance and leadership and tutoring of the spirit of God. In camp and at Sunday school, we sing a little song, the things I used to do, I don't do them anymore. See, you're a new creature in Christ. Old things are passed away. For, the, the, for such a drastic change to take place in the church among the people of these Thessalonians, the only explanation that is given here is not the preacher. Paul's been gone six months maybe even longer. And according to chapter 3 of Thessalonians, Paul sent Timothy back to Thessalonica because he was concerned that the persecution that, was risen, that, that had risen up amongst the Thessalonians might have snuffed out the young infant church before it got a chance to grow. But Timothy comes back with this resounding testimony and Paul records it here for us in 1 Thessalonians. He is amazed. We are amazed to read such a witness as this. How did it happen? Because they received the word of God as it is in truth. The word of God. So when we open the Bible, we need to understand God is speaking. But you know what happens? You know, as soon as the pastor starts preaching, preaching about worldly music, Someone starts climbing all over your old favorite records, your, your Bob Dylan or your Alice Cooper or your Moody Blues or your Beatles collection or whatever it is. You say, oh, well, you know, he's not preaching Bible now. He's, he's meddling. He's messing around with my life. Well, no, what he's trying to do is move you away from the world and further in your walk with Christ. When he challenges you about your devotional life, the Spirit of God wants you to spend time saturating your soul and your spirit in the Word of God so that you can become more like Christ and less like the world. 
Now, every year of my Christian life, I have a Bible verse that I try to make very real in my own life. The first year I was saved, I got a life verse from, from Revelation and chapter 4 and verse 13. And I got a yearly verse there from John 3 and verse 30, which says, he must increase and I must decrease. The he is Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. The he is the son of God who died for my sin and rose again to save me. The he of John 3.30 is the king of kings, Lord of lords, the soon coming ruler to reign over all the earth. The one who will sit on the great white throne. The one who will judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and at his kingdom. He must increase. He will not increase if all I ever do is read novels and speculate on, on the internet. If all I ever do is Google. In order to grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, I need to know and learn and feed on the word of God. As we said last night, as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. We're told there that it's an attitude as a newborn babe, nothing satisfies the hunger of a newborn the way the milk, the mother of the milk, uh, the milk of the mother satisfies a newborn. When we had our, our first, our first child was a premature baby. He was very, very weak, and he used to feed with a little syringe and a, a tube through his nose down into his belly. He didn't weigh very much; there wasn't much of him. And I'd sit there with this little tube of breast milk that had been expressed and put in the tube and we'd slowly watch that tube going down and then he'd fall asleep and it would stop going down. And I used to just flick the bottom of his foot and he'd wake up and start crying and the little tube would go, down it went. And then when we got home, the, the, the doctor had said to us, look, you need to get a special orthodontic dummy for him because he, he's, he doesn't have enough strength for sucking. He's never going to be able to breastfeed properly. He's not going to grow unless he can feed properly. So you need to get one of these dummies. And when he's sucking on it, it'll strengthen little muscles in his mouth. I can tell you now that he's 36 years old, he doesn't have trouble with the muscles in his mouth. But back then he did. And so at that time, I, we paid nearly $20 for this fancy Duvalaki dummy. You know what? I don't think he had a problem with his muscles then. He could spit that dummy the length of a queen bed. I mean, he'd stick that thing in there and he'd wrap his tongue out and boom, out it went. And when he was crying and wailing at three o'clock in the morning, he didn't want a dummy. He didn't want mummy rubbing anything. He didn't want dad to stick his thumb in with honey or whatever on it and, and suck on my thumb. He didn't want his own thumb. Now, you put a dummy in their mouth and after a while, the stomach tells the brain, you are being ripped off. I'm not getting anything here. There's a lot of sucking, but not a lot of feeding. And then out comes the dummy and wah, wah. That, that's the appetite of the newborn babe. When's the last time you cried out to God to feed you from the word? That's an attitude. That's an appetite. But it is also with an aim. He says that ye may grow thereby. We're not meant to stay little babies. I often say this to people, there's nothing wrong with being a little baby when you're a little baby. Now, I'm looking around the screen here, and I can see over here in the, uh, in the house of Cruise 2. Is that Cruise 2? Hello, Cruise 2. Yep, okay. I'm, I'm going to guess that I can see a little guy sitting next to you there, a cabbage patch doll or something. I see five years old, ten years old, uh, probably about five or six, I don't know. Anyway. Uh, we're going to get some fingers. We're going to say six. That was a good guess. Now, you see how big that little, that little one is now? If I came back to visit in 10 years' time and that little fellow was the same size as he is now, you would be a worried parent. If I come and see Ella in a year's time, or I should say in three years' time when the lockdown's finally over in Sydney, and Ella still has to be carried around everywhere, I can guarantee you Daddy Ron and Grandpa Freddie are not happy people because there's something wrong here. We are meant to grow. 
and in the spiritual realm. Look at the spiritual growth of these people. These were people who used to worship sticks and stones. They used to worship the work of men's hands, these, these vain, empty, worthless idols. And now they've turned to God from idols and not only turned to him, but they're serving him. Where did they get it from? They got it from the sufficiency of the word of God. But you see, the receiving here that I speak of doesn't just mean that they heard it, but that they obeyed it. They obeyed it. To me, one of the most tragic scenes in the Bible is the prophet Jeremiah falling down at the feet of wicked King Hezekiah, pleading with him to obey, I beseech thee, the word of the Lord. Zedekiah came under a cover in hiding to ask Jeremiah, is there any word from the Lord? And Jeremiah served it up hot, straight, said this city is going to be delivered into the hands of the king of Babylon, but if you do this, you will live. Submit, surrender, go out and throw yourself on the mercy. Nebuchadnezzar is the appointed agent of God to punish this people for their sin. But if you will obey and go and surrender, you will live. He pleaded with him. The weeping prophet pleaded with this wicked king, just obey the word of God, but he didn't. And you can read it there in Jeremiah, the testimony where Zedekiah's own wife and children were killed before him. Then they plucked out his eyes and led him away to die a cruel death. The high cost of disobedience, the word of God. You know the problem we have in the world today? is so many Christians still living under their old world pattern. They're still living like God doesn't exist. Oh, they confess with their mouth. But in their works, in their walk, they deny him, just like they were in the book of Titus. That is not the testimony we have of the Thessalonians. They received the word of God. And he said, and it was working. So let me ask you tonight as we close, what change has the word of God brought into your life? The word of God claims to be perfect. We've seen that in the testimony by way of inspiration, preservation, inerrancy. I mean, we shouldn't expect anything else from a God who is perfect, from a God who is infinite in wisdom who is all-knowing and all-powerful, why, why would you expect to, to find a, a testimony from the Word of God that's flawed? And when the Word of God reveals the lives of men and women of God, it doesn't pull any punches. Yes, it tells us that David was the man after God's own heart and the sweet psalmist of Israel, a man that God set on high, but it, doesn't, it does also tell us that he was an adulterer and a murderer and a liar and a cheat and a thief. It tells us that Abraham was the great father of the faith, but it also tells us that he was a liar and a coward. See, the word of God serves it up straight, folks. The problem is our receiving it and obeying it. And if you're not obeying it, you're not receiving it. And therein lies the difference of the sufficiency of the word of God. It is sufficient, but I need to be obeying. It will profit me nothing if I continue to live after the flesh, if I continue to live after my old sinful life. Has it changed you? Maybe that's the reason a lot of people don't like to read the Bible. Oh, they bring it along to church on Sunday from one week to the next, but they never ever open and look at it in between. Why? Because every time they open, it's like opening the door of a blast furnace. Every time, every page of the Bible they look at, God's got his finger on something in their life, on their giving or their living or, or, or their, their walk or their witness. I mean, some area of their life, in their marriage, in their family, in their parenting, in their, in their childhood obedience, some area of life. You know, folks, I'm amazed at times at, at, at the, the terrible choices 
the worldly, godless, unholy alliances and choices Christians make in the world today. That's not obedience to the word of God. That the man of God may be perfect. That's prospect. The product is perfect. The word of God is perfection. The product and the pursuit of the product is also perfection. The hindrance is not God. The weakness is not the spirit of God. And no, the weakness is not even the house of God or the servant of God. Pastor is a good man, a good preacher. He's just a man, but he's still growing in grace and knowledge himself. If there be flaws in the life of any child of God, you can usually trace them 100% of the time back to some area where we have not obeyed God. So let me ask you tonight, are you obeying the word? The word which worketh effectually in you that believe. Do you believe that? I believe that. I believe it because it's God's word. God lays out before us this wonderful testimony that it, that is, it makes me covetous to think that these people are so highly regarded miles away from people that would they would never ever meet and yet they're having an impact even to this very day the testimony of the thessalonian christians is still touching and changing lives that is amazing that is the power that is the sufficiency of the word of god i trust that you will see and lay hold on the sufficiency of the word of god for your own spiritual life and your walk and testimony with Christ. Let's pray, shall we? Father in heaven, Lord God, we thank you and praise you that your word is perfect, that it is forever settled in heaven and that you've magnified it above all of your name. Your word is pure. Your word is perfection. And your word is that which is needful for the children of God to grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. If we would increase, we would be feeding the flesh. But if Christ would to increase in us, it'll come from us feeding and obeying the word of God. And as the spirit of God opens the word to us, continually challenging and bringing about growth and change, we can glorify you, we can honor you, we can please you. And we look forward to that day when we would hear our, our Saviour say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Just to see a smile on the lips of the Saviour because we've brought our lives under the authority and received the word of God as it is in truth, not the words of men. Lord, do a mighty work in our hearts for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you again.